So welcome to the frontier or space, whatever analogy you prefer, where we are exploring um, what we are coming to call as a collective polycentric governance explorations and Web3 ecosystems. Uh, this has been, as uh, Angela and some of the others mentioned, a very much uh, collective uh, research into the space. So uh, today we have four presenters who are coming together from varied experiences, backgrounds, different parts of the world to share knowledge from experience uh, in building decentralized uh, ecosystems and across the DAO and common space. So if you want to go to the next slide, Livian will introduce everyone. So Jeff, if you'd like to introduce yourself for those who may not have met you yet. Totally. Uh, my name is Jeff. I've been doing a lot of work uh, at the Common Stack uh, with Block Science, with CADCAD, OneHive, a bunch of different um, organizations, the Token Engineering Commons, of course. Um, and yeah, really interested to be diving down this rabbit hole of uh, governance exploration. And um, we have a few new concepts today that we'd, we're excited to share with you. And I'll uh, pass it over to Renzo. Hello, everybody. Excited to just join this uh, movement about governance innovation. Uh, based in Berlin, I act as a UX researcher slash civic designer. In the last couple of years, I've been collaborating with uh, with Jeff uh, stack also with uh, with Angela. I've been uh, part of the uh, uh, token events at the Berlin uh, blockchain ecosystem in uh, in the summer, and lately I've been uh, giving a talk about the uh, uh, the the combination between platform strategies and governance token design. So I'm here to just uh, collaborating and give more contribution to the movement. So happy to uh, pass to Livia. Lorenzo, I'm Livia. Um, I'm based in Brazil. Um, I'm in the Commons Stack team and also been leading the cultural build of the Token Engineering Commons uh, since last year. And yeah, really excited to talk about governance. Also recently finished the ecosystem value flows course of the uh, Token Engineering Academy, super recommend, uh, very interesting. And yeah, happy to talk more about governance and share our experiences so far. And I'll pass back to you, Jess. Yeah, I'm Jessica Zartler, and I'm also a member of the Common Stack team, working um, in ecosystem development and special projects and research collaborations, also working with block science uh, part time as well for research and supporting translating the kind of many languages that uh, come in this cross disciplinary field. And then also am a steward for the token engineering commons, which is working on advancing the field of token engineering and um, doing kind of a lot of weaving in the ecosystem and cross pollinating. I think this is a group of uh, edge walkers and all of you here are the ones kind of bringing this knowledge and, and sharing across ecosystems. So look forward to what's going to come out of the session today and I'll hand it over to Jeff to introduce what we're going to this be chatting about today. Great. Do you want to jump to the next slide? Awesome. So we'll start out with a bit of a landscape in uh, web, introducing Web3 governance. Am I muting, Jeff? Um, so we'll take a few minutes just introducing what are uh, Web3 ecosystems and what does governance mean within those ecosystems. Um, and we've broken down um, this seminar into two main sections. So first, we'll talk about uh, defining the decision space. Um, and all of the um, sort of cultural considerations and the context of different decisions that need to be made in these kinds of ecosystems. And we'll have a short uh, breakout session uh, to get some hands-on experience with what some of those decisions might look like. Um, and then in the second part of the session, uh, we will be exploring the voting space. So looking at the tools available um, to determine some of the decisions that we decided on within the decision space. So, um, you know, essentially in the, in the blockchain space, there's sometimes a tendency to lead with tools first. Um, and we believe that there's really a, an important need to define and understand the needs and the context of decisions being made um, and then match the tool appropriately to uh, that context. Um, so that'll be the kind of two main sections that we'll be covering today. And of course, we'll have a session at the end for uh, some discussion and Q&A and we look forward to some lively um, input from the, the audience as well. Here you go, perfect. 
All right, so what are Web3 ecosystem? So a lot of people call these DAOs. Um, of course, these can be unpacked um, to you know, have several components and um, ultimately they're, they're web native institutions that coordinate on shared issues. So DAOs often have you know, a token. Um, that token may control funds management. It may be used in voting. There may be reputation. There are various roles. Um, so these are sort of groups of diverse state stakeholders um, in digital settings that are sharing resources. Um, so using tokens, for example, to allocate communal funds to projects that uh, improve the well-being of those in the community. Um, perfect. So yeah, we're kind of going with this meme here uh, that there's this myth about one governance tool to rule them all. We're seeing a lot of the discussion and dialogue around um, you know, people thinking that there is some magic solution that's going to solve um, for all of our decision-making and coordination issues. And that's just not true. So what we're gonna do is uh, in the next slide and in this journey together, uh, we're looking at it as more of a journey, which is very much unfolding, it's emergent. Um, and in the next slide, what we're really gonna do is we're going to burn our kind of overly simplistic mental models of governance. And we're gonna really start to unpack the complexity that is coordinating with humans around the world that come from different cultural norms, different backgrounds, and figure out how to move beyond this very binary discussion, uh, which is mostly focused on consensus algorithms and kind of at the protocol layer, proof of work, proof of stake. This is how a lot of people are having this discussion. So we're going to, try to expand our perception in this journey together. And um, you can see here, you know, I, we pulled this direct off Twitter. Uh, there, there are people just kind of saying, you know, hey, we've solved governance, <laughs> we've done it. <laughs> oh, really? Um, so yeah, we, we see this kind of dialogue. So what we're trying to do here is plant the seed and, and also with you um, build uh, this kind of group that can go out and, and start to chat with a little more, I guess, depth and context about how uh, we can have better decision-making both culturally and of course, looking at what tools are, are appropriate. So as Jeff mentioned, you know, some people are kind of looking at solutions first. So what we're saying here is, all right, let's, let's flip this on its head a bit and let's really sit with the problem. Let's understand the decisions um, that, that need to be made and choose really the right tools and the context that can address um, and those challenges of kind of these coordination issues or challenges. So starting from this place of curiosity, exploration and questioning and definitely questioning our assumptions. So uh, when we have this kind of open design space and we're approaching starting the build of, of a DAO or uh, a decentralized community, starting with questions uh, rather than looking at solutions first. So we're kind of naming this the decision space so that we can have this collective terminology uh, and, and a frame uh, through which to look. And that sounds all great, right? So Livia's is gonna chat from her uh, experience and what that actually means and what it looks like uh, in implementation. So she kind of led me through some questions yesterday, actually, that we wanted to share with you. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Jess, uh, what kind of decisions did you take today? Oh man, well, what to eat, uh, what to wear, not so much. I think kind of the Steve Jobs approach is pretty good of just having like, you know, Jeff says he just wears one pair of pants all the time so he doesn't have to make decisions. Um, what else, what to post on Twitter, I guess. Um, yeah, life's not too crazy because of COVID, I'm mostly inside. Whether or not I want to go for a hike, um, yeah, those kind of things, I guess. So yeah, Twitter brought up kind of this interesting discussion then. Um, yeah, that this, I think this understanding of the decisions that we have uh, bring the awareness of um, how they influence this space around us. So for example, if I, if I decide what I'm gonna eat today, this decision will most likely only influence myself. And this is already a decision that I have that maybe some other people don't have. So even understanding what types of decisions um, are, um, 
are a privilege to us or what type of power do I have in certain decisions? So even though the food I'm gonna eat probably affect just myself, uh, maybe just uh, having the power to make a decision about a tweet uh, influences other people. And maybe she has that choice and other people uh, might not have that choice because of how, how much decision power they have. So uh, yeah, this awareness of how much decision-making power we have and what are all the decisions we are making every day really help on uh, setting up this decision space, and especially in a group, in this complex groups that we are a part of. When we all have this awareness, it makes um, a lot easier for us to question our decisions and uh, to have more coherence when, when making group decisions. Yeah, and just to add to that too, I mean, the content is important, yes, but also just to get in this practice and habit of questioning is really, I think, what is reflected by this decision space, so. Um, Jeff and Renzo, do you guys wanna jump in here? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I think that's a really great framing that um, you know when we when we have a decision to make as a group, there are some um, key stakeholders to get on board. You know who um, who has a say in the decision, who has the most expertise, who is most impacted by a decision. Um, you know, making sure that these voices are heard and even amplified, um, so that we can make um, appropriately aligned decisions. Um, that match the interests of the stakeholders who are, you know, both uh, experienced, trusted, um, and impacted by those decisions is a really important consideration of that uh, decision space. And also, um, in token weighted or in token voting systems, we can also determine how to weight those voices, um, so we can make sure that um, you know minority voices are heard accordingly. Uh, for example, um, if we are in a society that values such a thing. Um, then we have that ability to um, kind of lift the voices and, and get a better collective signal from, um, you know, groups that are um, oppressed or, or traditionally have not had the voice um, that they've deserved at the table in a lot of these kinds of decisions. Yeah, probably I, I would add an additional, uh, um, yeah, lens on, on this slide, say the decision space and body space is a, a kind of zooming out and zooming in uh, before to embrace a, a tool that's supposed to uh, solve uh, a problem. So uh, the complexity of governance, as we know, as we go through this, requires an awareness of uh, what kind of decision I'm gonna take. Um, and therefore, what actually Livia said before, is kind of guide through uh, sort of touch points. They are crucial to uh, frame and reframe the problem in the decision space. And then when we go into the voting space, we are, I think, much more equipped to, uh, uh, to understand, okay, for each context, there is a different type of voting space, uh, especially in, in, in DAO settings or in, in blockchain space. So we, we are aware that our uh, quadratic voting, as you see, the um, conviction voting, I will go through this later. So I think it's, it's two colors just to give you two different dimensions as well. So zooming out and zooming in is important instead of just to give yourself directly to a technical uh, tool. Yeah, so we can move into the defining the decision space. And first step first, we need to understand um, what is this uh, initial space that will um, provide the, be the best ground for us to make the first decisions. So I like to think of decision-making as something that it's constantly evolving. So we don't need to have um, the ultimate uh, best plan at first because that's most likely gonna change. So what is this, um, the initial step with what we have, how can we understand um, the stakeholders that are present in the very beginning of a project or a process that we're gonna be using and evolving decision-making. Um, so what are the tools that we have available? What are the first things that we need to decide? So having, um, yeah, a, a first initial consensus, and that's usually 
easier when there are less people involved because this requires a, a bit of a framing at first and this will help bringing more people on board. So if you decide that uh, first decisions are gonna be taken in a meeting and in that meeting, you have a certain process for how everyone shares their voice, uh, for how uh, you start to see coherence being achieved, mural boards and um, yeah, participatory uh, sessions are really helpful for that because you can see all the information displayed and make sense of what is there. So I think it's important to have this first uh, step somehow defined as a process because when you're gonna change a process, it's much, it, it's, so, it's so much easier to change a process when you have one established because even if you don't have established, you have it, you just don't have it clear for yourself. And in the future, if you need to change it and you don't have that clear, then uh, it's gonna get messy. So yeah, just first step first to have this um, initial space to become decision ready. So there is a few, and we're gonna expand more on the decision ready, but um, there are a few processes of conversation, of um, um, interactive boards, of meetings, that um, you start to organize information to be like, okay, from here, we can make an actual decision. Yeah, and a lot of this, it seems maybe obvious or it's kind of intuitive, but I think pulling it out into this, you know, making this a part of this process and creating a frame for decision space, then it becomes more like conscious and intentional. And then again, as Livia said, you can kind of plan and know that you'll have to have a lot of clarity, initial clarity and communication around what are the processes and how can those processes be changed from the get go. And this kind of understanding that things are probably going to change. And then once you do that aspect, you can start to look at what needs governing. And um, so beyond the proof of work, the proof of stake and the consensus algorithm, what, what needs governing within the community? So we're kind of seeing three layers uh, that we're identifying as the community layer, funding layer, and then the kind of smart contractor on-chain layer. And we're not saying these are the only layers and definitely would love to hear some feedback on expanding you know, this frame, but there's this is kind of emerging and where you have people looking at community constitutions, uh, policy, codes of conduct and dispute resolution. Then there's kind of fund allocation, rewards for contribution or work. Um, some communities uh, are, are very focused on intrinsic motivation and say incentives are coercive and other communities use systems um, to incentivize people to do work. So there's a bit of a spectrum there. And then this uh, smart contracts and looking at uh, protocol upgrades or uh, the parameters of the token economy and making changes, who has the power and how uh, are they able to change that and how can they petition for any changes. And so that leads us to looking uh, a little a little deeper and some of the questions have already come up. Um, so looking at, okay, what are my assumptions here? Uh, I assume that everyone has the same, um, I you know, when I say culture, even the word culture, um, I'm assuming that everybody has the same understanding of what that is. Or when I say uh, community constitution, I'm kind of assuming that people know what that is. But again, having this really clear communication and even questioning the language that we're using and that others have the same understanding of that language. Um, and then looking at what decisions that need to be made that are, again, we don't usually sit and know what decisions we're gonna to need to make. Uh, they are just emerging and, and kind of happen. And then Livia has this great point here of looking for common ground. I don't know if you wanna expand on that. Um, yeah, I think also this is a common assumption that we will have a common ground, but is there a common ground? And I think this is a great point for start questioning our assumptions because um, assumptions come much from our cultural experience and from our way to uh, view the world. So I come with a preconceived understanding of many symbols that make sense to me along my life. And when I communicate with people, I assume that they have uh, similar meanings for these things that I um, 
uh, that I have an understanding myself. So when we, uh, when we ask for a common ground and we start talking about what are things that make sense for all of us or uh, what are even the semantics of the words that we choose, like what does this word means to me? What does this word means to you? And then through that, we can start refining somehow of a common place to start or a common direction to go towards and uh, a lot of the decisions, they emerge from this process because um, sometimes uh, consensus, like consensus, it's mostly, um, it's not so easy. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's hard that like, you're gonna start talking about a topic that multiple people are passionate about and consensus is just naturally gonna be there. Um, and this is great because when um, different opinions emerge and different assumptions start to be questioned, then uh, some of these decisions are going to start to come up and be like, oh, okay, so we have this and that and that, and how do we go from here? What do we choose? So yeah, I guess I just want to open it up for just a minute, just for a few quick comments. Does anybody else, does anybody want to share any other questions? If you want to go back one slide, Libby. Um, what other questions, oh, sorry, the questions for exploring, what other questions would we want to ask um, in this exploration? Does anybody have any thoughts? I think there's a question in the chat uh, from Angela. Oh, okay, great. Thanks, James, I didn't see that. So um, Angela wrote how to make sure that everybody's voice is heard. Are there any other questions um, that we should be asking when exploring the decision space? I think on that line, I always trying to think of how to get cultural alignment into the point that was just brought up in chat, how to allow people who are not as comfortable, who have different styles and different kind of uh, communication uh, mediums where they will shine and feel more comfortable how do you, on the one hand, create all opportunities for everyone to comfortably engage while not overwhelming people with so many options of how to engage that it, it, it just starts getting yeah, confusing and, and intense when trying to engage initially? Uh, I wanted to follow up on that. Um, just looking at the, at the sectors, you have economics and then the legal side and cultural side, and, and those have intrinsic characteristics of people that the economics is mostly extroverts, cultural is mostly introverts and, and legal it's, it's kind of like very balanced people. And usually in startups or in, in they, don't, they don't show up, you know, there's usually a, a lack of one of the, these temperaments are not there. So it's interesting to see how to make sure that they're uh, participating, although, you know, it's hard to get an, an introvert to participate. Or, or to get a, a balanced person to to give opinion other than their state stable. So it's it's uh, you know taking it into more a physiological, spiritual side of things. It's it comes down to these three kind of gestures of people. Mm, that's really interesting. And Andreas, did you want to expand a little bit? You wrote, do we need something like decision literacy or data literacy to be core competence for everybody? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm involved in a lot of data related conversations, especially also on the regulatory uh, space. And there really there's a big topic about data literacy to be a common, let's say, knowledge or skill that everybody needs. But we are re re very much lacking it. I mean, it has to add, it has to start with school at the end. I think um, there are people who would be able to actively govern systems on that level. You just uh, described it's not easy. And therefore we think, need to think of what are the basic skills everybody needs to have. And probably also how can we create systems that everybody can use? So, I mean, we, we talk about a lot about experience, user experience, customer experience, employee experience. I think we also need a governing or governance experience and we, even if it's not optimal, we sh need to make it accessible for everybody. Mm. Yeah, great points. And then also, um, 
we're gonna go on to the next slide, but we'll definitely have some more. Well, did any, are there any last um, questions? I, I wanted to make a quick point, if that's right. Sure. Thank you. Um, no, I was thinking that as we think about inclusion, diversity, uh, allowing multiple voices and so on, and it's very much undeniable that that has a benefit. Uh, but I think it's also important to consider that it has a downside, that the more diversity, the more inclusion. I think it was a little bit mentioned with, if we have many options to communicate, then it can be overwhelming, the number of platforms. And the more diversity we include, the harder it, it can be to reach consensus and so on. And I think it's important to mention kind of like the shadow of diversity or the dark side of inclusivity to think about it not as a, as a binary choice, like one is good, one is bad, uh, but rather think about it as a process. And instead of thinking, how, how are we very inclusive from the, like, say from day one, and how do we account for all these million different use cases and personality types and so on that can account is more, how do we create a meta process that can improve the way we do it? Uh, and so think about it like more as in setting the intention early on and building an approach to constantly improve in that area without necessarily trying to, to get perfection from the get-go, because it can also become paralyzing. Mm, yeah, awesome. That's, yeah, definitely a huge point. And I'm just gonna mention a couple others and then we're going to move along because we still have a lot to share, but we're gonna have some open space and just a few um, so we can open this discussion a bit more with an interactive exercise. So yeah, a few more things are, do we want to be open and closed, transparent? Um, how do we want to weight voices? Do we want to give subject matter experts more say in certain um, areas? So the, yeah, lots of questions to explore here, but again, just the, the act of questioning and, and, and some of the points that were brought up here about um, cultural understanding and, and finding this common ground. Um, so yeah, then, um, and, and this brings up uh, the next point, which is, you know, just because we have a vote uh, doesn't mean something is democratic. So obviously how it happens in dictator states, they have a vote, but, you know, it doesn't mean it's democratic. And on the next slide, any of you that have kids, I actually had a few years teaching little ones. Um, there's this little trick that you do with kids where you, you make them think they have a choice, but you actually are giving them two things that you want them to do. So kids, you can clean your room or you can read a book quietly. So is that really democracy? Is this true democracy for the children? I mean, definitely not, but you know, don't, don't tell the kids, this is the trick we use, but this happens, right? This happens in our, um, in our political systems. So this is like the whole point, you know, of, of asking these questions is to figure out who is actually deciding what we're voting on to begin with. And is it true democracy if you don't engage with people on this process and, and have, um, have some, some space for them? Um, yeah, just expanding mm -hmm. a little on this point is understanding what are the choices you can have beyond the choices that you can immediately see. And I think we have been conditioned in society to um, only be like, like, like this light, like Jess was saying, like to only see to um, only, only approach like voting, for example, every four years when we have the chance to do that by the government. But this brings back the awareness of the decisions we're taking all the time and every day and doing this exercise more and more uh, starts to give us a little bit more of an open view of oh but what are what are the choices I have beyond cleaning my room and reading a book quietly like can I bring that up like what if a question brings that question what is a what if a child brings that question to the mother it would be like oh 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 uh, yeah actually you have that <laughs> that other choice too and then you would have to debate a little bit more. So yeah, when you when we start to ask these questions, that's when we see polycentricity emerging. And to to be honest, when I first heard about polycentricity, I was very much like looking at it top down, like yes, we must impose polycentricity, we must design for. But that's not actually um, how it happens. It's actually when you start to ask these questions that this this space comes for different kinds of decision making, and we 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 enable this polycentric um, decision-making to emerge. So for each kind of decision, choosing an appropriate tool or a stakeholder group. Um, and yeah, there are no panaceas, but 
um, of course, you know, trying to tools do many things. So, so looking at what is the most appropriate one. Um, and sometimes we don't even need to go as far as to have a vote. Maybe it's just a, a really honest, a little bit harder conversation or, or there are some other tools that we can use. Um, so yeah, and that brings us to hierarchy. Um, I think in a lot of decentralized communities and in kind of the ideology, people think it's a bit of a dirty word, <laughs> but uh, it just needs to be used in context. So it depends, you know, this affects maybe the speed and the scale with larger groups, it tends to move slower. It's very difficult to get this group consensus. So maybe there are, for example, like smaller specialized squad DAOs within a bigger DAO that could iterate more quickly, or there are hierarchies perhaps within working groups where there are subject matter experts um, that can, uh, I guess, have a little bit more of this top-down decision-making. Um, but yeah, and, and non-hierarchy also, I think sometimes we talk about flat decision-making, we miss a few points there. And Olivia always, always talks about this so well in like the difference between hierarchy and leadership, which is also, again, these words kind of have these heavy connotations, but unpacking them a bit. Yeah, there's something we, we like to say in the TEC of the structure we've been creating that is non-hierarchical, but pro-leadership. So to imagine that a hierarchical space is tight. There is no, um, there is no room for expanding because the structure is very well defined, but leadership is a very important skill that especially when we want to make things move fast or that we want to have a certain pace, it's important to uh, have space for leadership and, and leaders, um, they naturally emerge. But then someone brought the point of like the most shy people, for example, like how to open space for um, different types of personalities, people that have different expertises to bring up to the table to have this space and to feel comfortable on stepping up on their leadership. So uh, I think when a space is pro-leadership, it expands as long as people start to step up. So the more people step up, more that space opens and the larger it becomes. So it's a matter of scaling as well. And, um, and, and then the coordination comes in and that's another challenge, but uh, having people feeling comfortable to express their voice and their truth in, in a space that it's supportive of mul a multiplicity of leadership um, is an alternative to to hierarchy and it, it goes more towards um, flat decision making. So yeah, um, and we're gonna move a little quicker, I guess, through these next couple of slides so we can allow for our interactive exercise and more space. But yeah, um, I, just talking about in socio-technical theory, how you know social and technical aspects are really interdependent. So the culture feeds the technology and the technology feeds the culture. Um, and I don't know, Olivia, if you had another. I think yeah, I think, I think we usually see them separated. Uh, and then there is the cultural layer and the technical layer, but I think they are very inseparable. Uh, even uh, economics being a social science and technology being used mostly by humans. Sometimes we forget that. Um, there is a great article that Jeff contributed to uh, with Block Science talking about the difference between uh, autonomy and automated and how when we talk about decentralized autonomous organizations, uh, we used to think about autonomous as uh, the, the technical part, the robots, the smart contracts being autonomous, but what about the autonomy of the people and, and how they are deeply interconnected. So the more we look into the social side and how the people are using these tools in the best way possible, the more we can evolve the tools and vice versa. So one starts serving the other and is this circular process that has no separation. So yeah, we have, um, uh, Jeff and Renzo were going to talk more about the tools 
And we are trying to explore what are the spaces that exist for consent and consensus that come um, before us needing to vote or before certain tools need uh, needing to be uh, used. So even uh, manifesto, for example, um, a document that people come together to uh, state what is the purpose of them doing something can be a consensus practice. Uh, advice process is, is a great tool that we use a lot. So an advice process, if you, if you propose something, um, when you're proposing that, you look for who are the people that are gonna be affected by what you're proposing and who are the experts in that subject. So if you have this awareness, you can contact these people uh, to give you advice on the process that you're trying to implement. And by hearing this feedback and these voices, and implementing this at your own discernment, you're probably gonna have a much better um, proposal or project than you had in the first place. And this allows people to be integrated with what you're doing. And if the way you integrated didn't work, then they have the chance to step up and propose um, another process like a voting, for example. Um, and then working groups with subject matter experts or with people that understand about a certain topic and when they are discussing, this can also be a space where a lot of decisions happen uh, and, it, and it's optimal and dynamic. So even meetings can be a decision-making tool, for example. If you have a little process that people can come together and discuss something, and get to a certain type of agreement um, that most of the times doesn't need to follow other types of decision-making. Uh, and also dispute re resolution sessions. Um, it's really important to have tools to come to peace agreements or to um, or having spaces that um, people can talk using tools like nonviolent communication, for example, that also uh, help on uh, a certain type of consent or consensus to be reached without um, without more specific tools. Yeah, and I think that that brings up, I mean, some, we've had so many learnings coming out of um, building the token engineering commons. And so we have this group Gravity, which Juan Carlos, who is here and, and Livia started for nonviolent communication and tra uh, conf conflict transformation uh, developing processes and trainings. Uh, but there are a lot of challenges because we are trying to be inclusive. We're trying to hear everybody's voice. Um, but I think we're still trying to find this balance between like flat decision making and waiting experts and, and how we actually do that in interacting in community is quite complex. So that brings up the challenges, which there are many. Um, I think kind of a yeah, Andreas mentioned education and especially in this space uh, with token ecosystems and so much knowledge to understand what is happening, let alone to be able to vote on it, to explain parameters of a token economy and how that works um, takes a lot more work. Uh, and also we have kind of information overload as I know we're all very familiar with. And of course it has a high attention cost to be conscious, right? So being ethical is not easy <laughs> always. Um, so having this like bandwidth to be able to really fully and explore these ways the best we can. And then also the complexity um, and nascent nature of these new systems. So even the language that we're using, we have to first explain. It's like all of these dimensions. Uh, Shebna Mruziska always talks about, uh, token engineering talks about, you know, we're building the roads, handing out the licenses, driving the cars in all the work we do it. It is so, it is so multidimensional and that's a big challenge. And then of course, with any groups, there are always dangers of groupthink and a lack of critical questioning. Um, and then power systems just have a tendency to become really quickly entrenched. Humans, it's so well documented that we are so resistant to change and we kind of quickly attach ourselves to the status quo. Um, so how to keep in that uh, mental, how to keep the mental model of that this process is iterative and that change will happen and new information will come and we will need to adjust our decisions um, for the for the needs of the community. And then 
having again a community where you can actually do this with that uh, will, will take responsibility um, so at the common stack we have the trusted seed uh, which is a, a curated group where we're trying to get people who are aligned um, with the mission of the organization to support public goods and uh, who want to see the collective benefit as well as the individual um, and we call this kind of healthy initialization condition so there's a consideration for that as well and then um, you know dr michael zargum who is the originator of a lot of these systems and idea always talks about governance as a dumpster fire <laughs> but a nicer way to say that maybe is that governance is a journey. It's not a destination, as we said at the beginning. So we really have to look at this decision space as evolving and as a process, as a few of you have also um, noted. And just to summarize uh, quickly our you know, high level um, bullet points from this section are uh, there's no perfect form of governance. Uh, diverse communities, they need contextual decision making, they need different types of decisions, uh, depending on uh, all of these different parts of the community, and then that there's a place for hierarchy for flat decision making. Um, this landscape is just so massive. So again, that's why we're exploring together here. And it's very much an experiment. We're kind of seeing what works and trying to integrate and improve as we go along and see what works for the community. Um, so, and also, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and also just keeping in mind that all of these things are a spectrum. And sometimes it, it's, I think we tend to think on it's either or it's this versus that and all of these tools and even from hierarchy to flat decision making, there is a whole spectrum of uh, other types of governance and organization that uh, that work for different communities. So I think it's, um, it, yeah, it's back to this exploratory landscape. So yeah, we're gonna move now to an exercise and we'll have some space there for discussion as well. Um, so there is a link uh, that we just dropped in the chat for the Miro board. And I hope some people are familiar. And if you struggle to get in um, quickly, you can also watch on the screen as well. But um, we'll give a minute here as everybody, uh, if you want to just like voice like, hey, I'm getting in or no, I'm struggling um, just for a minute to jump over to this board. So here we're thinking that we have a DAO or we have a DAO in the make and it's a governance research DAO where our mission is to advance governance research development and exploration, education. So everything that will help the government space to flourish. And, and we have a question of how we might advance the work of the DAO. Uh, how do we do it? What types of decisions would we have to, to, to make? So each one of you has uh, a little space here. You can put your name. If you don't want to put your name, it's okay. Uh, but you can um, bring up three decisions that pop in your mind of like, what would make the decision? What, what would be the decisions of this DAO? And they can be uh, any types of decisions. And if it's... Um, if it's hard to think about uh, decisions specifically directed to governance, they can be cultural decisions too, or decisions that you would have to make when you're in a group. Um, and then under here, we have how to decide. So uh, Renzo and Jeff are gonna explore that more in the second uh, part of this, of this session. But we want you guys to think of very intuitively, what would you, how would you decide, um, how would you approach the decision that you, that you put in? So yeah, we're just going to put um, two to, well, let's say three minutes, two minutes, let's say, on the board um, to enter your decisions and 
how to decide and then we'll do a small round of reflections and sharing and we've got um, about 10 minutes for sharing and also some discussion after this uh, next minute here where everybody's filling out their decisions. I wish we had Groovy back. I know we need some music. Should I sing? No. Does anyone does anyone want to sing? <laughs> it's good to sing. Surprise Zoom hasn't made a Jeopardy music plug in yet or something like that. <laughs> yeah, in the Discord we have Groovy Bot. You can play, you do like a command and you can play from YouTube or Spotify or Some Brazilian songs will be nice, Lydia. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I know a few, but they're going to be the same. Okay, for so a dance. Yeah. It never works so well for me when I put like in the computer to Zoom. I think there is a trick, but I'm not. I'm not okay, actually. I have a proposal for the music. Tell me if it works for everybody. And you can hear it. We have about 30 seconds, so it'll be short music. How do we decide on the on the music? How to decide the music? Okay, does anyone want to share? Or I will call on somebody randomly. Is anybody feeling a burning desire to share their decisions? I can share. All right, let's go for it. James, there you are. All right. So I'm still figuring out how to decide on metrics. I'm not sure if that's easy to put in a sticky note, but I was thinking about three decisions to be made high level. So deciding on the goals, I feel like that's important whenever you're doing something as a group. Timelines are helpful. So defining those goals in terms of specific timelines might be a second part of the first decision, but that's another category, I guess. And then how you evaluate success in terms of metrics, um, key results based on the goals, the objectives you have as a DAO. <laughs> yes, and maybe that surfaces, maybe there's gonna be people who realize like, oh, you're talking about timelines. I don't wanna be on a timeline. So even just to look at the types of decisions that are coming up here, um, and so yeah, feel, how would you decide? Do you want to go into the tooling a little bit or? Oh, well, I feel like a lot of the, the assumptions would be that funding is the main use case or like the main focus of a DAO. Um, however, I think it's a lot more important to think about mm -hmm. projects and, and kind of like the success overall in terms of community growth, for example, or uh, development. So you actually have completed work instead of uh, just like funding, which is the goal. Um, but it, of course, funding is necessary. And we have a platform that can be used for payouts based on results of proposals. And we've been doing that for this hackathon as an experiment. All of our prizes are going through that Sputnik DAO platform. So wanted to mention that because you asked about tools, um, but of course we have our governance forum as well for discussion. 
and we use project boards kind of all over the place. Uh, GitHub is a good place for, for project boards. We use that, um, but we also have Notion and, and other places. Um, it just kind of depends on the team and preference. And then for metrics, we, we have a dashboard that is being developed and, and that's kind of a question mark. So that's why it's not filled in yet. Um, but we have a system where all of our teams establish their quarterly objectives and key results with specific metrics. And that's kind of our, our approach, but the tools aren't specific um, yet. We have a dashboard in, in the works. I mean, it's up and you can see it now. I'll put it in the chat, but that's my, my few minutes here. Thanks. Does anybody else want to share or should we? I, I can share mine. Oh, sorry. Oh. You can go. go ahead. <laughs> All right, I, I'll do. Uh, first, you see there was a misunderstanding. I took just private decision making. What to do first in the morning, look at my to-do list. And this helps. I'm, I'm pretty tired and it's not easy to think clearly for me at the very first 30 minutes. So my to-do list helps for what decision needs to be taken and then select priorities. Then ride my bike. Can I ride? go on a bike trip today? I look at the weather forecast and this helps me to decide if it's a good idea. In Germany, it rains pretty often and you, want to be, you don't want to be surprised by a thunderstorm. And then should I leave my husband? I mean, this is maybe exaggerating, but this is a huge decision. I would ask some friends, um, should I or better not? And then, of course, then realizing, oh, we are talking about DAOs here. I just thought there's a pattern here, isn't it? So sometimes you have great helpers in taking a decision that are helpful individually, like my to-do list. So this is probably not helpful for Livy, but for me, it's incredibly helpful. Um, ride my bike, a weather forecast. This is a well-established tool to help everybody in everybody's life for decision-making. And then there are these huge decisions that are really very individual and where it's hard to have objective data, right? To, to take a look at, to assess if a decision left or right is, is a good decision. And I, so where's the, where's the relation to probably a DAO or a community? I, I think that Similar to a weather forecast, we might have great tools that help us in decision-making. And I think for the complexity of the questions on the table, uh, assuming risk assessment or for certain change of parameter or hatch parameters now, the decision-making here, having tools available that help us digest risks, benefits. This is great. Um, most of the times we don't have it though today. Then, how I, I can't envision now a tool that help us in individual decision making in, in, in DAO questions, but probably there might be some. And then there's huge ask some friends. There will be still, I guess, huge decisions that are very individual choices on values. Do I still share the values of this community or do I sh still share the route a uh, community is taking. And this might be then even more difficult, but at least I felt, oh yeah, looking at these questions helps me to maybe see a pattern. Hi everybody, I want to follow up on that. So, um, I I'm a I'm a private pilot and there's some functions in there that were in decision making that is in their lifesaver situations. And when you go into travel, there's three things you need to do is aviate, navigate and communicate in that order. So if you find yourself in a situation, the first thing is to gain control of yourself in the direction you're going. So make sure you're not upside down towards a, a mountain. Uh, second is to know where you are and where you where you're heading and where you want to go and the third one is to communicate as far as soon as possible anywhere anywhere else so that everybody knows where you're going so in this in in this sense it's like 
it's good to move forward as long as you have the transparency to then communicate and revert what you're doing. Uh, it's a bit of a, um, it's, it's, it's organic in the sense that you are collecting, you're working with this full uh, aviation system, but taking the responsibility of the first two things by yourself and then letting them know what you're doing. It's, in this sense, it's uh, somewhat in interesting to approach and it's saved my life twice actually. So it's a good, good method. Did you want to also share your decisions that you have there on the board, Sebastian? Oh, yeah, decisions. Well, it relates to that in a way that there's, I put a TEC proposal uh, based on uh, three-folding uh, sociocracy models and holacracy. And it, it kind of relates to that, whether can can the individual be a hologram of, in, of the whole and, and making sure that if, if there's not enough representation, then you can actually come up with uh, paradigms to actually advance without full quorum. Um, so if anybody take a look at that read there, it's, a, it's based on, on a couple of social structures that are in, interesting and uh, representative of the entire system. And um, yeah, it's, it's uh, take, a, take a little read there, so it's short. Can I go next? Absolutely. Okay, so actually I, I did three, but then I added two extra uh, notes there. So the first kind of decision I, I would talk about is resource allocation, allocation, kind of allocating money, right, in a sense. So I would propose the decision to be one token, one vote. So the token, hold, token holders with more tokens get to vote more because they own more of the, of the decision, right? And that's supposed to be a consensus of 80% unity and 20% quorum. So 20% of the people need to vote. And that's basically how we do this at Haifa. So uh, I think this makes sense for resource allocation. But for instance, for other kinds of decisions, for instance, changing agreements that impact all, impact the whole, this kind of decision making is somewhat poor. So. I would prefer to listen one person, one vote. So listen people individually because they are equally, uh, in a sense, uh, bringing voices that would matter equally to the to the purpose, right? So then I would also be checking for objections, not actually a yes or no vote, or I like or I dislike vote, but actually, do you see harm in this change, right? Do you see harm? for the purpose with this change. So this is in line with the sociocracy and holacracy consent uh, decision-making. So, and then when we need to decide regarding attention focus on what to do next, we have this hundred things to do. Uh, all of them are kind of equally important. Uh, anyone has personal opinions on what should be done next? How do we decide? Uh, then I, I would also go with uh, like this one person, one vote. Lean coffee style. I don't know if, if you used lean coffee before, but it's a technique for facilitation for group uh, discussions where you everyone adds like a post it with ideas for discussion, and then people vote with a bunch of uh, tokens for each of the post its. So, in, in essence, you take you start discussing the ones with more votes. So, this makes sense to to focus attention on what the group wants to do next in that group right now. So that makes sense for me. So then I added these two bars to the right. So all purpose driven decisions for me, uh, based on not your personal preferences, they should be done by consent because you are uh, working towards the purpose, not thinking about your own you know, personal preference. But if you don't see harm, and uh, if you're talking about the, the purpose, you should be using consent. But for decisions that impact personal preferences, I really like this or dislike this. And then it's fine to use consensus or, or voting, traditional voting. Uh, I, I, that's my general distinction here. That's it. Okay, wonderful. Really interesting. And yeah, we'll be coming back to this in the, we're gonna move to uh, part two now exploring the voting space and interesting Julio you brought up you know one person one vote and one token one vote um, we're going to explore 
um, some different, even different ways uh, and look at all of these different types and then do an interactive exercise that we'll be drawing on, on this first section. So um, thanks so much everyone for that um, enlightening session. And I'm gonna hand it over to Renzo and Jeff who are gonna bring us into the voting space. Awesome, let me just get my screen sharing working here. Perfect, thumbs up if you can see my screen. Perfect, <laughs> awesome. Um, so yeah, thanks for the fantastic rundown of the decision space and um, the, the next step here, once we've defined the decision space is exploring what tools are available to us and what tools match the context of uh, the decision space that we've uh, defined. So for each decision, there is a contextually appropriate tool um, and there are many different ways to decide. Um, I really liked uh, Julio, your um, comments about, you know, why one token, one vote systems are better than one person, one vote systems. Um, you know, and, and even therein, we have a wide range, you know, how, how we allocate tokens, you know, do we allocate those democratically? Everyone has the same number of tokens. Do we allocate them meritocratically? Um, you know, the more skin in the game, the more uh, time or funds you contribute, the more say you have. Um, we also, in, especially today in the Web3 space, see a lot of plutocratic uh, decision-making. In other words, those with the most tokens um, AKA those with the most money uh, or skin in the game uh, make a lot of the decisions. Um, of course, we can look at delegated options, quadratic options. Um, there's now continuous voting through conviction voting um, and a lot of other ways to decide. Um, so diving into some of those, a lot of people um, kind of hold up one person, one vote as the, the pinnacle of democracy, um, but it's actually kind of a, um, a binary system. You can either say you're for, or you can say you're against, you can't really uh, demonstrate how much you're for, how much you're against. There's no uh, intensity of preference in this system. Um, so this is just sort of a, a block diagram we show. These are three people making decisions. They have a yes choice or a no choice. Um, and then those get tallied up and the proposal passes or fails. So this is kind of making like a circuit uh, out of governance or you know, looking at it that way. Um, so one person, one vote. The biggest issue, it doesn't capture intensity of preference of the members. It's either for or against. Um, and there are a couple of uh, resources on the false promise of, of one person, one vote. Definitely recommend checking those out um, and figuring out how we can kind of move forward with uh, new, um, new ways to give people more intensity of preference in democracy. Um, one of those ways is doing one, one token, one vote. Now, of course, if we allocate those tokens democratically, if we get, give everyone, for example, 10 votes, um, now they can um, demonstrate how much you know they're they're for something rather than just for or against. They can be very for or very against or anywhere in between. It really gives us a spectrum, uh, a better signal that we can um, give to the systems that we are uh, operating within. But in the DAO space, we also have the the question: Should everyone have equal say? Um, maybe some people contribute more time or uh, more effort or more funds or more expertise. Um, and in that case, we can consider allocating tokens instead of uh, democratically, allocating them meritocratically. Um, and meritocracy has a bit of a, um, a funny flavor. It was actually, it's one of those terms that was introduced kind of to disprove its, itself. Um, so meritocracy kind of has this, this shadow um, associated with it sometimes. Um, but essentially what it means is voice through participation. Um, so if you put a lot of time into a system, you, you earn more uh, voice in that system. And if you put a lot of funds to bootstrap that system, um, then you also have more voice and more say over how that system evolves. Um, so we can see here, you know, the person on the top is um, uh, a small holder. So they only have five tokens. The person on the bottom has put a lot more uh, time or, or effort into this DAO. They have a lot more say, um, but of course they can choose how many tokens to allocate uh, to a decision. It's not uh, every token has to be used every time. Um, so they have a much, um, yeah, wider space of action in terms of demonstrating how much they are in support uh, or against different proposals. But of course, once we give some people more voice, uh, we have to consider the people who have less voice and making sure that we're balancing uh, between the needs of all the humans in these ecosystems, because uh, ultimately that's one of the reasons that we are all here is exploring 
um, how we can give voice uh, and, and make decisions appropriately as a collective. Um, and you know, minority opinions are also really important uh, to hear. So in the balance between these large token holdings and small token holders, uh, we can consider quadratic voting. Um, so a lot of you have probably heard of this in a couple of different contexts, but essentially quadratic voting can be used to maintain equity in an ecosystem. Uh, so in this scenario, we can see there's a whale who has a thousand tokens uh, and a minnow who has a hundred tokens. And while the whale has 10 times the tokens, when you actually vote with those tokens, uh, each vote costs uh, quadratically more than the last. So your first vote costs one token, your second vote costs four tokens, your third vote costs nine tokens, uh, and so on and so on. So that ends up with the effect that although you have 10 times the tokens, whales only have three times the influence because you actually take the square root of those tokens. Um, and you can see that this helps to balance voice uh, in a system where we want some people to have more say, but we don't want them to have so much say that they can just run away with the show and not listen to anybody else because this just creates um, broken institutions that won't live up to uh, the standards that we're trying to build here. Um, and of course, one of the uh, voting tools that we're really excited about at the Common Stack is conviction voting. So this is kind of a real-time signaling. Um, so you can see this bucket here, you can consider like a, a battery or even like a bucket filling up with water. And each of the token holders is like a tap. So the number of tokens you have uh, denotes the amount of water in your tap. And you can change your votes at any time. So this moves away from uh, time-based voting systems where you know we have a week, uh, for example, for presidential election or you know even a town hall, uh, we all get together um, and say, hey, here are the problems, now let's all vote. Uh, and then we take the, the result of that vote and we implement. Of course, when we move to decentralized decision-making systems where we are global in nature, we have uh, time zones spanning the world, it's really difficult to get everyone in the town hall at one in one space and one time to get up to speed on all the issues. Um, so conviction voting is an attempt to uh, address the um, de distributed nature of decision making in Web3 ecosystems and allowing for this kind of continuous voting or, or vote streaming um, where votes can be changed at any time. Um, those tokens charge up this battery or fill up the bucket, depending on the analogy that, uh, that you like to use. And then when it hits this uh, proposal passing threshold, uh, the, the proposal moves into uh, it's passed and then funds are dispersed and work begins. Um, so yeah, this is a, a different way. And just to note, tokens stay with the voters. You're not actually sending your tokens into the bucket. Your tokens just charge up the bucket. Um, and then, uh, so this can be um, analogous to how um, decentralized decision-making in nature works. You know, this is like neurons in the brain. Uh, when a neuron charges up enough action potential, it fires and uh, excites the next neuron and so on. And this is how we see um, distributed decision-making in, in natural systems. Uh, mycelium also works on sort of similar um, problem solving at the edges. So we're really trying to take some of the, the processes of, of natural decision-making and apply them in these kind of Web3 ecosystems. And of course, we can only do that now that we have these rich temporal data flows of block of blockchains, and this would be really hard to do with uh, pen and paper on a uh, you know traditional ballot. But luckily, we have these new technologies that allow us to question um, some of the assumptions that we had about how we make decisions and how we vote uh, traditionally. And some of the qualities of conviction voting: it allows for continuous dynamic input. Um, it also mitigates last-minute vote swings, um, and also what some people are um, uh, postulating about now is uh, sort of flash loan style governance hacks. Um, for those who aren't aware, flash loans uh, are um, kind of loans you can take within one block of the Ethereum ecosystem. And if you pay that back within that one block, um, then you don't have to, um, you can get away with, with uh, without repercussions. So some people are worried about, for example, someone within one block buying a, a massive number of Uniswap tokens, um, passing something on Uniswap, and then selling those tokens back all within one block. So we have these kinds of uh, flash loan governance attacks on the horizon. And conviction voting is one way by, by adding in the temporal aspect. It needs time to grow support in that community. You kind of cut that attack vector where 
uh, we might see um, in other ecosystems, people coming in, buying up a bunch of tokens, making a decision uh, and passing it, and then giving those tokens back all within one block. Um, another great thing about conviction voting is it moves from consensus to consent-based uh, decision-making, or at least towards consent-based decision-making, because it doesn't require uh, majoritarian support uh, for each decision. We can, um, yeah, decisions can be made based on sufficient support, even within a small locality of the DAO. One other flavor of conviction voting is a dynamic average consensus. So rather than having this um, proposal threshold uh, in which the proposal passes, uh, we actually just have a continuous range. So this could be used to set um, you know, a community tax rate or uh, budget allocation between various uh, sub DAOs or, or departments of a DAO. Um, and these people can continuously change their inputs. And for example, the, the rate will go up and down between some range. Um, and that can be sort of a continuous parameter uh, decided for the community using conviction voting as dynamic average consensus tool. So this could be a really interesting tool for uh, collective intelligence in allocating shared resources. Uh, it allows the community to give dynamic input on policy choices in real time. Um, and it creates uh, or could create less political deadlock uh, and allow for more natural flows in these kinds of ecosystems. Of course, uh, in Web3 ecosystems, there's a lot of people experimenting with uh, delegating trust, um, really exciting uh, potential to crowdsource the collective intelligence of a network it kind of creates a, a grassroots political system, uh, as you can see on the left here. So each of these citizens has delegated their vote to a proxy and the proxy can vote in, uh, you know, with the weight of all of the people that trust them. Um, of course, if you want to be like the citizen on the left here and vote directly, uh, you can and you have a proportional amount of say in the system. Um, and this allows us to uh, assign tokens to, you know, trusted uh, or experienced representatives or people who are impacted uh, by a decision. We want to make sure that they have a voice and uh, are able to feed into the process. And ultimately, this creates a more resilient and, and bottom-up decision-making network. So looking at um, consent and consensus, um, maybe I'll just take a moment to, to explain this diagram. So each of us has a sort of a small subset of things that we agree with and a much larger subset of things we can tolerate. And then everything outside of that, we, we, we don't want to happen. Um, so when we make decisions as a group, the overlapping area that we agree with is consensus. So this is, we both agree that this is how it should go. Um, but consent is actually a much larger overlap because it doesn't ask everyone to agree. It just asks everyone to tolerate uh, the decisions being made. Um, and of course, different tools sit within different kind of areas in this consent uh, versus consensus landscape. So something like a multi-sig wallet uh, would, would demonstrate more consensus. Um, so everyone agrees this is how, or we've set, you know, uh, doesn't have to be everyone, of course. We usually see um, sub quorum and support somewhere between 50 and 80%. Um, and if 80% of the people agree that this is what should be done, this is the consensus that then becomes binding and we move forwards. Um, to compare um, the advice process that we talked about in uh, part one, uh, I think Libby mentioned it uh, and chatted about it a bit. This is more of a uh, consent tool. So making sure that nobody disagrees as opposed to making sure that everybody agrees. Um, same thing with conviction voting. It's more of a uh, consent tool than a consensus tool because it doesn't require everyone to agree. It just requires uh, sufficient support in the community to move forward with the proposal. Um, and as we've mentioned a few times, the Token Engineering Commons is doing some great work uh, pioneering you know, Web3 polycentricity. Um, the three layers that we've kind of identified are the cultural layer, uh, you know, the, where decisions such as the code of conduct, um, dispute resolution, how we reward contributors um, are decided via appropriate tools on the cultural layer. Uh, for the funding layer, we plan to make use of conviction voting. Uh, this will uh, allow us to seamlessly distribute resources and uh, economic value to everyone that's participating in the TEC. And then finally, we have the smart contract layer, which is sort of the, um, the highest access layer 
This is uh, voting to configure, upgrade, change smart contracts, fix them in the case of bugs. Um, and we have different decision-making tools for each of these layers of, uh, of governance within the token engineering commons. And with that, we're gonna jump over to the final breakout session and have some more uh, discussion on various voting types and uh, get some more feedback from you guys. Did you want okay. to share the mural board, Renzo? Yes. So first of all, thank you so much to be with us this far. So I will share the screen and just, uh, I guess you all see it as a voting space. Uh, if you don't, just a signal in the chat, but I, I suppose we are all here again. So I guess we are going towards the uh, 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 connecting the dots and sense making part that you've been listening from the decision space, uh, the importance of understanding what type of decisions is to be made. And we're going towards the voting space as uh, Jeff listed uh, quite uh, so uh, four main way to the to uh, approach the voting space. So here in this section, uh, we're going to look at um, uh, what happens when the democratic uh, approach happens. So uh, the democratic, as we all know, have one person, one vote and has some shortcomings. So uh, we vote uh, just uh, uh, every uh, few years. Um, so there is uh, lobbying, it's expensive, and there is potential corruption uh, behind. So uh, instead, we're going to move towards the uh, one person, 10 votes. And I will just uh, set up now the, uh, um, the voting space. And if you just uh, give me one uh, minute, I will just uh, set it up for two minutes. And I will explain you that we selected um, three decisions uh, based on what you, you've done uh, previously. And um, as now I will press, you all should be able to uh, vote on those three decisions selected in the uh, democratic allocation, one person, 10 votes. So I press now start. You will have uh, two minutes to cast your 10 votes based on those three decisions. Please uh, bear in mind that uh, they might not uh, match the decisions with the tools, but it's more about now understanding the dynamic of 10 votes for one person. So I'm pressing now, you should be able to cast your 10 votes. So now, go. We're choosing our favorite decision? Yes. Okay. So you can pick actually your um, favorite decisions. And as Renzo mentioned, this is the less important about the specific decision. We're just trying to get a, a tangible feel for what it's like when you have uh, 10 votes per person compared with one vote per person. So if we only gave uh, gave everyone one token to vote. You could only choose decision one, two, or three. But since you have 10 votes, you can have a much richer um, signaling space. You can you know, say maybe you like decision one a little bit, you like decision two a lot, and you don't like decision three at all. And with 10 votes, you can allocate uh, as you like between those uh, with a much richer signal for the, for the DAO. Hey Jeff, so you voted on all three. How, how's what's what's that mean? Can you explain that a bit? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we're looking at Renzo's screen right now. Um, but uh, yeah, so ultimately, the the type of decision being made is a is a big factor here. A lot of decisions um, in DAO ecosystems is deciding between different proposals. Um, so there may be, uh, for example, three decisions or three proposals up on the table. Um, we have these three uh, as an example. And there may be different members of the community who 
are in favor of all three. Um, you know, they may they may think that all three need to move forward. However, other community members may want to prioritize only one of those or two, uh, or perhaps you know veto even one of them. Which I think there would need to be di different uh, kind of decision making system because we don't actually have uh, negative voting in uh, in this tool. But there are definitely um, other tools to manage that. But um, ultimately, we are looking at kind of different tools to allow people to express their preferences in whatever way they find appropriate. Did that answer your question or did you have another thought on that? No, I love how meta okay, thank this you. is. Yeah, so we want to, uh, again, share this diversity of impact of different uh, um, voting um, approach towards decisions and therefore so from the democratic to uh 10 votes one person there is any reflection that you want to share based on actually what you um express on your decisions and how to decide uh there is anything that you want to share at this point Okay, yeah, so quickly go ahead. Then, uh, yeah, I think it's very rich to be able to not have a yes or no, but actually to direct your where you want to focus instead of saying, I, I dislike this, I like this. So maybe I don't have to, you know, uh, um, well, this I, I miss this, uh, this option to kind of block something because, for instance, I, I wouldn't decide what to post on Twitter. <laughs> in a DAO, so I would kind of block this kind of decision there. But uh, it was very nice to be able to allocate, you know, this, these tokens and see what happens. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Gila, for this. So uh, eventually here, you can see there is a potential of uh, expressing an, an intensity towards uh, a decisions, which is different from uh, democratic and meritocratic. So meritocratic there is any way minorities uh, less behind and there is an unequal reward system. Uh, and then actually we, we move now uh, towards that scenario. So we, if we are going towards the uh, here on the meritocratic allocation, so imagine there is for the decision one, there is Jeff, the decision two, there is Bob and Jeff, and then decision three, there is Alice with three votes and Jeff and Bob. But if I come because I have more saying than anyone else because the merit of having more power, then there is, I have all the shots and I make a decision just based on what, what is not actually being decided collectively. So this is a, the, a, the scenario of meritocratic. And then moving even uh, down on the quadratic voting example is what uh, I think before Jeff mentioned there is more a balance about the voting power. And actually there is um, a real exist scenario that happened in uh, Colorado in 2019. And um, there was actually a collaboration between the Democratic Earth Foundation, a radical uh, X exchange, and uh, they experimented in the uh, state of, in the, the parliament, in, 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 in um, Colorado State of House, sorry. They just, uh, they, they experimented how they could vote uh, towards uh, bills. And, and eventually what happened there was uh, they solved the problem about the, the tyranny of the majority. Uh, there was also, um, uh, uh, they reduced the factional uh, control problems. And uh, as uh, Jeff explained before, so there is this uh, square votes after your first vote. So there was more balance and there was more a sense of prioritization of what to address. And I will share anyway the, the the articles about the, the Colorado that happened uh, two years ago. And so and from, from this point, I think we can move towards the, uh, the last conviction voting uh, simulations that I think you can see here. We, uh, we actually, we would want to design the session in a more practical experience as possible. We have to, conscious of time, we also want to have a sense-making uh, process from what you listened before, the breakout session that we did, and then now with this uh, voting system, that we are sharing, we would like to ask you what actually is the difference before. But before, uh, I think we can watch the video and Jeff maybe 
uh, you can introduce more about this uh, uh, simulation. Sure. Can everybody see the sim uh, the um, the GIF? I see it's loading for you, Renzo. Um, yeah. Maybe if it's oh. taking a long time, I can. Uh, you want to share your screen? screen. Sure. Sh shall oh. I stop? And you want to share yours? Maybe it sure. works better yours. Yeah. All right, there we go. So this is um, uh, sort of a play simulation that was created to demonstrate conviction voting. We, wa we wanted to give uh, a tangible feel for how it works as well, but it's really difficult to do in a Miro board, as you saw kind of moving tokens around, it's hard to demonstrate how uh, those tokens can grow in weight over time. But this is actually one of the um, key components of conviction voting is that the, your weight, your voting weight is charging up the longer you leave it uh, towards a proposal. So you can see, uh, or maybe if I zoom in a little bit, so at time 20, um, you know, one of the voters changes their stake to 1,000, and you can see that it takes a period of time before it actually charges up to 1,000 uh, weight. And then at the next time step, we have uh, the second participant joining and also staking uh, 1,000 uh, tokens towards this proposal. And then you see in the third step, uh, this participant takes their stake away. So this is, it has the ability to charge up and discharge or like a, like a bucket of water with a hole in the bottom. Yeah, everyone is pouring their tap into the bucket, um, but there's also a consistent uh, drain, which could be, um, you know, loss of attention or loss of uh, interest in this proposal. Um, but ultimately we have this um, threshold at the top here, and we can see that once support in the community passes, passes the threshold, uh, the, um, the proposal goes through, funding is released, and work can begin on that proposal. So that's kind of one uh, one view of how conviction voting works in terms of your weight, the weight of your vote growing over time. Um, this is also one more demonstration of conviction voting kind of from a system level. Okay, it's just loading. Uh, so this was one of the uh, models uh, and simulations that we did for conviction voting. So along the left here, we have a bunch of red dots. Each of these red dots are participants in the DAO. Uh, on the right side, we have uh, blue dots are um, suggested proposals. And you can see once people uh, support that, so these red lines between are uh, DAO participants supporting proposals. And the more lines you see, the more support there is, the darker the line, the more tokens that holder has. So this is a model that uh, takes into account the uh, meritocratic um, process. So all of these token holders may have different token holdings. They may have different preferences over which proposals should be passed. And you can see that uh, these charge up to 100%. Uh, then they turn yellow, which means in progress, and then green uh, for complete. And this is part of a larger model we have that's looking at um, how these systems work. Um, this was created in CAD CAD, which is a, a simulation and modeling tool. And you can do kind of agent-based modeling and system dynamic modeling. Um, and of course, one of the things we're really excited about at the Common Stack is validating our decisions and, and tools um, before we put them live into a, a deployed environment. So this is just kind of another system view of how um, participants support proposals and those proposals charge up uh, in support and then they pass, funds are um, released and then the project is executed. Um, so just giving sort of a, another higher level of view on conviction voting there. A question, um, Jeff. Yeah, please. So if I am um, a member and I have like a thousand tokens and there are like 10 proposals, do I have to allocate my thousand tokens between the 10 proposals? or uh, and i can only allocate them back once the proposal passes and or i withdraw the tokens so it's always uh allocating my tokens between the live proposals is that it just to make sure i understand so there's actually even with conviction voting there's quite a few ways to configure it um i've seen a couple of different um ways that people have uh have gone about it thus far um, OneHive is one of the, the first deployments, actually the first deployment, um, and you don't have to allocate all of your tokens. So if I just like this proposal, this is, this is OneHive, by the way, and this is their uh, proposal board, and this works using conviction voting. So if I want to support a proposal, um, I can click into this one, and I can choose to 
uh, allocate my uh, voting weight. And here's the threshold to pass. So it needs uh, 2.59, or sorry, 2.64% to pass. It's currently at 2.59% support. Um, but you can also put your votes in an abstain proposal. So essentially this makes, um, it slows down the process. So if you can, if you think of this almost like a metabolism, like this DAO is um, churning proposals through continuously, uh, and the abstain proposal is sort of a way to slow that down. So if I want to uh, hold, uh, like slow down the system, essentially, I wanna say, hey, we should make decisions and we should make them continuously, but we shouldn't make them too fast. I can actually put my votes towards abstain. Uh, and this actually slows the conviction growth across other proposals. So uh, I'm not sure if that um, added or helped with your question, but you don't have to allocate all of your proposals or all of your tokens to a proposal. You can allocate to the proposals you like, and you can even allocate to the abstain option, which slows down other proposals. So we don't have a way that you can um, stop other proposals, but there are ways to kind of increase the viscosity of the system if we're worried about you know decisions making uh, being made too fast or funds being distributed too fast. Also, just to add to that, yeah, Julio, you're kind of feeling into the fact that and this is very new. So the design is pretty wide open, even for no one has really tested or implemented um, conviction signaling and dynamic average consensus that Jeff was talking about. So there is so much room here to explore. And as you also said about blocking proposals, we have this abstain, which doesn't really block. So another iteration that's coming is uh, called Celeste. It's disputable conviction voting. And I would say this is more for proposal spam and kind of fraudulent claims that you would want to remove from the system. But um, it is still being built and hasn't quite been tested. It's somewhat like a judicial system, but I guess um, they don't want to be calling it jurors. They're trying to come up with new language and how to explain how this disputable system would work. But basically you stake your tokens if you want to dispute or remove, have a proposal removed. So it costs the, the co it actually costs um, to participate with this process. So um, this would hopefully be only for fraudulent proposals, but, but yeah, I think there's a lot of ways that we could explore the design of the system um, and look at some of these aspects that, that you're bringing up. Are there any so I guess, yeah, no, I guess I was, uh, uh, even though, Yulia, if you want to go, go on, I just want to kind of wrap up to uh, ask everybody. So if now you look back at your, how you decide for your decisions, based on what you experienced so far, there is any reflection or any a different mismatch on how you analyzed your context and how we could maybe create a dynamic sense-making conversation where we can share uh, pro and cons and this polycentricity approach towards the decision space uh, thanks to the voting space. That's our final purpose to, uh, to move at. Uh. One question that I had was, um... Are you able to change the proposal when it, once it's up for voting or after it's open for voting, you can't change it anymore? So this is very critical for, for HIFO, for instance, right now. That's a great question, actually. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's been um, discussed that much, but I, I can see what you mean, because if you uh, put one thing, you, you're going to do X, and it gains support, and then you change that at the last minute to, to doing Y, uh, this is actually an attack vector. You've gained a lot of support uh, for something and then changed it at the last moment. So um, uh, yeah, ultimately, whenever we deploy these systems, we need to make sure they're deployed in, in an appropriate context. So I think whenever a community is looking to deploy conviction voting, questions like that are the exact ones that need to be asked. Um, and then we need to, to design protection against the attack vectors that can take advantage of, of these systems because ultimately the tool isn't the, the end goal. It's the, the process that involves both the, the culture, the context uh, and the technology and the tools. And we can build these into uh, responsibly designed systems, but ultimately it, it will change so much on a context by context basis and what you're using the tools for. Um, so these are important questions to keep top of mind uh, throughout, I think. And the place yeah, that... Sorry, go ahead. 
Okay. Yeah, the place where we are now with these tools is that we are using the forum um, or that's that's how we've been thinking about uh, making proposals so that they go first to the forum and then that forum link goes to the conviction voting app and we have the risk of that happening but then a cultural layer comes in that is um, you can see in the forum when uh, was the last edit a, a, a post had or if that post was edited, for example. So there are practices that you can continue to speak about of like, oh, if you change something, please post in the comments um, or even not. To, we, um, we have a little code of conduct for proposals and one of the topics is uh, that this should be avoided to the max of changing a proposal after it's posted, but probably this is something that will be integrated in the tool itself in the future, something like that. I want to... Yeah, I was going to say Eugene had made a comment on the chat. Yeah. Um, did you want to share a little more, Eugene, on that before we move on? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's just, I always wonder in terms of how people interact with these systems. And I thought that this running the exercise the way you presented it today was a very good kind of manifestation of showing uh, where there are points for possibly being less sort of accountable for what you're doing and how, how much can I just barely dial in, get a sense of what people are talking about, do a quick vote and hop out. Versus, you know, if I want to delegate my votes, I have to understand who, who can I possibly delegate to? What are the specifics of what's being discussed? And it just sort of, in my mind, on the one hand, it forces me to be an active citizen of whatever ecosystem and community I'm part of, which I personally love the idea of. And, you know, I feel like a lot of us are very much on like, what are the incentives to get that little uh, active citizen bug awake in more people? And I think that that's the part that I have no clue how to answer to. So I, I would love to hear if y'all have had any experience of sort of running this with people who don't want to be more active citizens and are very content with their limited kind of interaction point. Um, yeah, just how that goes and what are the possible ways we can help people realize they might enjoy being an active citizen more if the structure around it is a more enjoyable experience than it currently is. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the one of the main um, reasons conviction voting came about was um, to cut down on the barriers to participation. Um, and you know, uh, one of the issues with with DAOs I find these days is high attention cost. So trying to find tools that can elicit the right signal without requiring uh, massive overhead in either learning tools or um, you know knowing when to participate or where to participate. Um, you know, if we make voting available anytime. Um, you don't have to remember that it's on Thursday and then on Friday you go, oh, I missed it. Uh, or, you know, having to um, know when and where to meet, you can just do it anytime. So improving the, the user experience in some of these tools is really important and, and cutting down that attention overhead cost, I think is, is a key part to uh, getting that um, democratic participation in these new form of online institutions. Andreas, I think was a, uh, you would uh, end up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm just thinking about a combination of quadratic voting and conviction voting, quadratic conviction voting, because I see some benefits in both. And I think there is a possibility to combine it probably. And what I like with quadratic voting is especially you would focus, first of all, you are very much driving participation of a small uh, um, influence uh, participants because they can have a comparably higher vote, uh, higher voice, and you um, avoid extremes. In classical one person one vote, we, ha we have a tendency to mobilize the extremes, and the big majority or the, the, the centristic views are underrepresented. And you also have a stronger um, um, bundling of votes into topics that you are very much. Um, influenced by. So if there's something that has a high influence on me and I'm a minority, I can at least uh, bundle my votes. 
And also, if I'm very, if I have a very strong conviction that my vote is right, I would also uh, bundle. So I think um, the combination would be very interesting to do. Definitely, um, and a lot of the tools that that uh, we're working on are um, composable. Of course, they have to be designed appropriately to be composable. Um, but you could you could definitely have quadratic conviction voting. Um, and we're really excited for um, more interest in, in these tools because ultimately we, we want to design them to be useful in many different contexts. But of course, some contexts may require layering of these tools as well. Um, so definitely, um, yeah, exciting that, uh, that you came to that same conclusion. <laughs> but also, I would like to uh, go back to your point, Andres. You, you made the beginning about the educational aspects. So I think here is very crucial that communities are aware of the potential of these tools and therefore by engaging communities by understanding how these tools could enable and then it's linked with all what Eugene said that I, I try to kind of um, get rid of my apathy how if I understand the impact of the governance uh, in nobody tools it makes me feel important so I have let's say ownership of my decisions and I feel more involved in the process uh, for intensity, uh, quadratic voting, conviction voting. They are very uh, useful, but needs more experimentation. I think that's also the direction about this group that we put together. I think in July, just to give a, a step back with, with Jeff, we did something similar without the decision space. And thanks to Jessica and Livia, we put the, the decision space. So we created both, uh, let's say, areas to involve and make people think about the whole process. So. Thank you for the input and uh, the reflection. Makes sense, great, yeah. Yeah, and I think the biggest problem is low participation rates. I'm not sure how you see it, but <laughs> the most important thing is how can we make people participate and use the right to vote and govern? Yeah, yeah I was thinking too, like I was just writing to Eugene, um, we have a lot of game designers in the community and kind of behavioral psychologists. Uh, and I think just making it more fun or why do people engage so much with Facebook and Instagram? We have to kind of have these, you know, really smart UI UX people that, you know, okay, you're, you're staking your tokens, you get little hearts. Like, I don't know what works for people to have this kind of dopamine drip or driving the behavior to participate, but hopefully it's in a more healthy way and not so dysfunctional and something that's also good for, you know, people's mental health and, and everything else. But yeah, I mean, I'm a, being a communicator in this space, I think it's, synthesizing and digesting the information and having more kind of short form communications like through emojis or memes. That's why I think memes, you know, are so great and powerful and TC is like going crazy with memes. So maybe, you know, a little more balance, but, um, but we have like meme parties where we all sit and we churn memes. And, but I think if we can get more focus in how we apply it to communicating about what decisions need to be made and then kind of some pros and cons in a fairly you know, objective analysis that just more easily digestible content, contents because people are just, I mean, you're blasted all day long from so many angles, um, it's an attention game. So uh, what are the things? And I think Antonio, you have some interesting ideas about this as well. Um, like how to make this more engaging and um, you shouldn't have to like make people engage. It's like, it's so fun or inviting or the, the dopamine is there so that people engage. Uh, well, I, uh, from the earlier conversation of like uh, choices, um, thinking a, a lot about like collective karma and individual karma and in the games we play. Um, and uh, the question I just asked uh, to myself is why don't we have more Farmville style uh, like agricultural simulation social networks for for yield farming. So uh, if anybody like worked at Zynga, maybe we can like get them. <laughs> yeah, we're missing gamification. Uh, I mean, the good gamification, right? Not the one that addicts people, but the one that drives towards purpose and allows you to connect and to express, you know, and, and feeling social uh, feedbacks from people around you that you know that you're heard and you are participating. So there's quite a lot to be done there. Maybe to TikTok. Prevent this overwhelm. You have to dance your your uh, proposal. But I also think <laughs> that's a great idea. Of the mindset. Uh, I mean, 
we are le in school we learn to follow other people's advice or we have to follow other people but we do not learn to have a voice and I, if i look at my last 20 years of employee life you have to do things you have to perform then uh, it we, we learned we have to learn continuously and now i think we have to learn we have a voice <laughs> i mean <laughs> We have a voice, and we should spend time on 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 using that voice and to educate ourselves and really participate in communities and so on. I mean, it's not for free, and you have to invest time and and knowledge and so on. Yeah, yeah I think there is a key part of engagement that is a knowledge. Like even when you're playing a game, if you if you're really good at the game, if you know how to play it, it's more likely that you want to play more often, and you will want to play with multiple people or people that you don't know. And I feel like in in this governance system, sometimes everything is so like over the head. Uh, people have like a general sense of confusion and not everyone understands wh what they're doing, where they're at. And the more we can offer information and education and interactive onboarding, I feel like the more people feel engaged and participate. So maybe we don't have a problem of engagement of or of voter apathy, but a problem of um, yeah, how information is being shared that uh, touches the point Eugene was talking about. And uh, we have been having a very interesting example of that in the TEC, um, that we have this dashboard for like understanding how to build the parameters of a DAO. So a very educative process on how this technical parameters are chosen and, and done in a playful way and people can discuss with each other. And we've been having an incredible voter turnout. So in the last vote that closed yesterday, we had 66 unique participants voting uh, on the parameters of the DAO. And 66 people voting is huge. I mean, it, it was two weeks that this was open and that has been following for the last few votes that we have in a similar uh, way where people can participate and uh, understand a lot about it. So I think that's a key point for engagement, just like knowing how to play. Was that out of 200 people or two or 300? I think around 200 people. So that would be I think the just, average percent in blockchain is like 3% or something participation and and our we had out of a couple of hundred people at least. I think that's awesome actually. I I just wanted to add that I I tend to agree to Livy. It's more about information and less about gamification. Uh, at least if this is really this matters for your if we're talking about huge decisions and I think that, mm, of course, at the moment, we are somehow, our, our um, recognition of voting is somehow distorted by the fact that we are experimenting and things are popping out, uh, are popping up all around us every single day, 24 seven. And this is very overwhelming, but uh, think about, okay, five years down the road, um, we might be members of two or three ecosystems that really matter to us, to our, to our life, to our, um, let's say what we can achieve, uh, what matters to us on this planet or on a very local scale. And I think then it's much more about information and less about gamification to um, drive participation. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, yeah, maybe we'll just take a, a couple of minutes to wrap it up. I'm sure we can chat about all these topics for much longer, but uh, in the interest of letting everybody get to their next call, um, ultimately, the point we're trying to get across here is that technical tools don't solve social problems. Um, and in order for blockchains to be useful in, in real world uh, problems and applications, we need to match the appropriate tools to the context of the decisions being made. 
Um, so for that, we of course, we need to define the decision space and understand the purpose uh, and the goals of these kinds of decisions before we explore what tools are available to, um, to access those in the voting space. So we kind of have this um, lunar decision space where we're exploring what it is that we need to decide um, and then getting, uh, perhaps we have consensus tools before we even go to voting tools that can be used like uh, the advice process or uh, dispute resolution processes, et cetera. Um, of course, for some decisions, we need technical tools. So this is kind of getting solar, um, how we um, cut down the list of options and choose one uh, or multiple to go forward with. Um, so ultimately, what we'd like to leave you with today is that this governance landscape is wide open for exploration. Um, a lot of these tools are still very new. They can be combined in different ways to suit different contexts. Um, and this exploration has only just begun. Um, so our goal is to create these open blueprints for digital commons governance. And of course, these, these tools will be applied in so many different contexts and, and uh, applications that uh, is, is really up to, up to you. And we're excited to work with everyone here who uh, is interested in using these tools to uh, build the more beautiful world that our hearts know is possible. So thanks very much. Um, we would love you to join uh, our Discord. We actually started up a governance research channel just for this session. So if there are any follow-on uh, conversations, uh, we would love to uh, continue discussing in, in the Discord. You can also follow us on Twitter. Uh, oh, and Julio is sharing something. I can't quite make out the title. What is it? It's the book by Charles Eyes Einstein, the, 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 built, the most beautiful word that our hearts know about. So I was just starting to read. Thank you. Nice. Is that Sacred <laughs> Economics? Is that the one? I know it's an Eisenstein quote. I'm not sure which book it's from, actually. The, the book is called The, the, the Most Beautiful, the more beautiful, word, beautiful that... world Our Hearts oh. Know is Possible. Oh, that's yeah. the book itself. That's nice. the title yeah. is the name. Yeah. <laughs> I know I've heard him say it, but I, I didn't know which book it was from. The whole There's a whole book on the topic. Perfect. <laughs> and if I can, a quick um, advertisement. So we thought it would be good since this session was so packed with us talking that tomorrow we would have some more opportunity for discussion. And actually, there were a few topics that we talked about, such as um, the ability to modify rules, which is Eleanor Ostrom's principle three and principles for governing a commons. Um, so we're going to do only like 15 minutes to 20 minutes tomorrow presentation on cultural frameworks for DAO governance and looking at Ostrom's principles um, more into dispute resolution and cultural frameworks. Um, and then the rest will just be more open discussion. So um, I hope you all can join um, for an hour or even half an hour tomorrow. And if you know anyone that's interested in uh, the cultural side and, and Eleanor Ostrom and a little bit of Danone Meadows and, and just more, we wanna hear more from you since we talked so much today. So if you can join, um, we, would, we would love to spend more time together. And yeah, if you jump in the Discord, I would love to continue these discussions. And Angela is um, planning something for July and August to maybe have a governance research group um, that is active for eight to 12 weeks within the Token Engineering Academy to really look at maybe um, building some tools or educational apps or whatever it is that the collective would like to apply their energies to. So that is forthcoming. So we'll just stay tuned. Um, yeah, absolutely. Looking forward. <laughs> awesome. Can we call the game Common, Commons Crossing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you get to choose your spirit well, thank animal. You. Thank yeah. you so much, everybody. I really appreciate this. Yeah, awesome. Thanks a lot. Oh, I have to take those thank down. You. Sorry. Thanks, thank you. Thank you, everybody. This is a great right. session. Thank Thanks, you. all. See you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> okay. Bye. Oh, bye. Have a good day. You too. <laughs>